Ross and the team, that was great. And it's great to uh, have the bio guys with us, isn't it? It's been a real encouragement to have you guys sharing the gospel on our doorstep when the world comes to us and you take the opportunity. And I feel very jealous. And it's great that you've done that and we appreciate very much. We're in a great part of this, the Bible this evening. Uh, just one verse, which doesn't mean it's easy. Uh, Hebrews 11:21, And uh, we're going to be asking... Uh, as we've been asking all the way through, how to live a life less ordinary. How we can live a life which means something in the grace of God. And it is an awesome story of God's goodness that we're looking at. But let me ask you a question a bit provocatively to start with. And it's this. What would your final words when you die, just before you die, what would you like your final words to be? Uh, what would you like to achieve as a last, lasting legacy from the final time that you open your big, loud gob? What would you like as a consequence for your life? Well, maybe if you're thinking about what your legacy could be, your lasting legacy, here are some uh, thoughts of final words for you. Here's a, here's a guy, George Best. And not an ordinary guy, was he 1946 to 2005? Pele himself called him the best, which is not bad, is it? The greatest footballer in the world. And George lived a life of excess. Um, he had the world at his feet, didn't he? And yet, despite all that, he goes down in history really as a man who really wasted his life. Somebody once asked him, George, what have you done with all your cash? And he said, well, I've spent a lot of it on booze and birds and fast cars. The rest I just squandered. Uh, he lay in Cromwell Hospital in London, uh, from dying from multiple organ failure, and he's repeated to ask God to forgive him for wasting his life and hurting his family so much. And his last final words were these, one, two, three, four, five words, don't die like I did. A lasting legacy to a life which was wasted. That's the summary of it, a wasted life. What about... Siddhartha Gautama, better known as Buddha, uh, 536, sorry, 563 BC to 483, tried to live a life of awareness. He believed the secret of life was to question everything and that wisdom and certainty came from doubting everything. But in his death, you know, he didn't have any certainty about the future. The instruction he left behind for those who followed him was this, work hard to earn your salvation. The sad thing, of course, is that anyone who tries to earn their salvation will never have certainty that they've got it, because none of us are good enough. Now, the truth is, we'll never have certainty that way. And so he went into an uncertain future. He went into eternity, not knowing what was going to happen to him. Hebrews 11:21 gives us a very different story. The Bible says, we need to be sure about how we're living our lives, and Jacob because of God's grace, in his final words, was a man who was sure. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of his Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. It's a picture of security. And you can summarize Jacob's um, final words really in three words. He blessed, he worshipped, and he leaned. In, in a nutshell, he had a life of faith, says the Bible. And that should really surprise us, because if you've ever read his story, then you know that actually he spent most of his life running away from God, and not living for God at all. And yet the true testimony of his faith here is that he had genuine, bona fide faith in the living God, and his faith meant that he had a life that counted. Now just reflect on that for a second. When we come to our final days, people will listen to what we say. If I can put it this way, people will watch us into the grave knowing that we're dying. And that's true of you as a Christian here this evening. The younger generations will watch you as you get older. And the true test of what you say will not be how eloquently you say it, but whether your life really backed up what you were saying. It's sobering stuff. And yet the Bible says, here's a man whose words are backed up by actually his heart before God. And yet... These authentic words we find are in his weakest hours, and yet the man is strong in faith. He wasn't just an extraordinary man. He 
was a very ordinary man, but he trusted in a God of extraordinary grace. And his life full of failure was just like ours, often messing up, often with regrets, often falling short of the glory of God, and yet he grabbed hold of the God of extraordinary grace, whose promises never fail, who's extraordinarily trustworthy. You can depend on him with your very life and death. So he lives a life which counts. And by the grace of God, the Bible says we can have a lasting legacy, which means something in this world. Not just a life, which means something, but we can leave others with something that counts because of Christ. And every Christian should do that, says the Bible. That's what Hebrews 11 is about. If we owe Christ everything, we should be looking to leave a life lived well for him, says the Bible. And of course, the true hero of faithfulness in Hebrews 11 and the whole of Genesis is not Jacob or anybody else, Abram. It's God. He's the hero of faithfulness. But anybody who lives and dies in him can live well and die well, says the Bible. And ultimately, Jacob does pass on the baton of faith to the next generation. He leaves a legacy of trust, a trust legacy, saying, trust in the living God, whatever you do, trust in God. And so as we go through um, quite a big chunk, Genesis chapter 25 to 50 is what we're going to do in the next 25 minutes, a pocket survey of this guy's life. I want you to notice that the object of his worship is what he's pointing us to. The one who he leans on is the one that he's pointing us to. And there are just three aspects I really want to focus on this evening. And these are the three. He's got a strong trust in the power of God. He's got a transparent trust in the company of God. He spends time with God and therefore people see it. He's got a humble trust in the wisdom of God. So as we fly, as it were, at 5,000 feet over this guy's life and do 25 chapters in a few minutes... Just see that this guy's life is extraordinary because of God. And particularly as we start the power of God. His story starts in the power of God. A God who knew him before he was born. A God who has pre-knowledge of human beings. Chapter 25 in Genesis. Why don't you turn back to Genesis 25 and verse 23. And that's really where the story of God's power starts in this man's life. The Bible says that every human being is made in the image of God and in the full knowledge of God. And incidentally, that means that we should cherish the sanctity of life. It means that from the earliest unborn, pre-born fetus to the most elderly lady sitting in the hospital bed, our God knows every human being. All our days are viewed by him, ordained by him, says Psalm 139. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. And that was Jacob's story. So it starts in verse 23, prophecy to his mum, Rebecca, a prophecy that Jacob will be strong. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other. The older will serve the younger. What's God saying? Well, he's saying, by my grace and power, I'm going to do extraordinary things for Jacob. That's interesting because really he was just an extra on the side of the stage at this point. There was nothing extraordinary about him. And God does extraordinary things despite Jacob, not because of him. And he included him in the promises that he'd made to Abram. That covenant promise, that promise that would last for all eternity, that he would have a great people of faith who lived because God lived, who lasted because they trusted in the living God. And from birth to death, This guy's life is marked by God's grace working powerfully in him. You can separate his life into four stages, really, four scenes, if you like, on the stage. And the first one proves that he's not not a naturally good man. He was a grabber and a deceiver, says the Bible. So even as he comes out of his mum, he grasped onto his brother's heel, didn't he, if you know the story. And that original word for grab means deceiver. Uh, The connotations there are of... Satan, the father of lies, that he's like a child of the devil. It's not a good start in life, is it? And he grabs not only onto things that he shouldn't, but onto his brother's birthright. Chapter 27, if you flick forward, chapter 734, tells us that he leaves the home in a bitter mess. There are loud and bitter cries in the home as he walks away. And he grabbed the blessing 
But God was good to him. 28, 3, God comes to him in grace and Isaac blesses him. May God Almighty bless you and increase your numbers. And then scene two. He was deceived. It comes back to haunt him that he was a deceiver because he's deceived by Laban. He ends up working seven years for Leah, a wife he didn't want. And then another seven for Rachel, the woman of his dreams, a 14-year stretch. Some people often say, don't they, marriage is a life stretch, a life sentence. It really was for Jacob. And actually ends up working 20 years for Laban. And there's that glimmer of honorability as we get through the chapters to chapter, 20, chapter 30 and 31. God blesses him. And God honors him for the hard work that he's done for Laban. And then we get to stage three and we really see a, a real change in this guy. He was grabbed hold of by God. God grabs hold of him. Chapter 32, verse 26. We see that he's grabbing hold of the man that God sends to sort him out. He says to him, 32, 26, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Now, there's two significant things that happened at that point. First of all, his name's changed to Israel. And it says, because he knew the power of God. Verse 28, you have struggled with God and men and have overcome. He was known as a man of power because God's purposes were working through him and keeping him, and keeping him going. And he was known as a man who was transformed by the grace of God. Uh, verse 30, I saw God face to face and yet my life was spared. It's the story of my life, says Jacob. God's powerful and God's gracious. And so the final scene, which Hebrews picks up on, we see that he's not only grabbed hold of God, but God has grabbed hold of him for his final moments. On the outside, he's a very weak man, says Hebrews. He knows his days are up. His knees are weak and wobbly, and his skin is scorched by the sand of the desert and the sun wrinkles on his face he's lived a full life he, he's had a good innings as we say his muscles have all but gone and he's got these multiple chins sorry if that's a bit graphic off a gaunt face and you think he's just skin and bone he's ready to go his hands are weak can't do anything yet inwardly says the bible he looks incredibly strong because he trusts in the power and the promises of god and God has hold of him to bless others. He blessed, says 1121. That's my story, says Jacob. God's blessed despite of me. And God has a story in everyone, says Jacob. And my story is his story, what he's done for me. He's not only in charge of all time, God is in charge of all my time, says Jacob. And on mine is an amazing story, he says, because God's an amazing God. He's held on to me. He's turned me from a grabber to a giver. From one who grabbed hold of blessing to one who gives out blessing. And you can trust God, says Jacob, in all his promises, because his power means that he's able to bring about everything he promises. Even when we fight against him and we fail him, he's got good purposes and so you can trust him, and you must trust him. And he says that to his kids and his grandkids. And he says, I'm pleading for you. You must trust the living God. He's all the strength you need. What a testimony of a weak old man. And a great story, a great encouragement to us, isn't it? When you look back on your life, maybe you're sitting there this evening thinking, well, yeah, I'm not sure God can use me, because you look back on my life, you think, well, I had a terrible start. I was brought up with a shocking family, awful memories, I deceived my dad, I was manipulated by my mum, I hated my siblings. Yeah, and that was Jacob's background too. And yet God redeemed him, made something of his life, made an incredible difference to this world in God's plans because he came to the living God. Hebrews 11.21, by faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. What was that staff? Well, it was a symbol of the shepherd. I lean on him, was basically what he was saying. I lean on the shepherd God, who has the power to take me through life and death. He blessed his people. And he blessed them in a way which Genesis recognizes as the way of blessing all God's people who trust in the shepherd. 49, Genesis 49, when he blessed them, 
49.15 says this, Then he blessed Joseph and said, May the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked faithfully, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has delivered me from all harm, may he bless these boys. He looks at his family. May they be called by my name, names of my father Abraham and Isaac, and may they increase greatly on the earth. He wasn't being proud when he said that. He was saying, God, work your purposes through them. Because that's all I want. Because you're the God who keeps your promises. And he gives them two instructions. And the first instruction is, as you trust in the God who keeps his promises, I want you to do something for me. I want you to leave my body in the place of promise. First thing I want you to do is about where you leave me, my grave. You want, I want you to bury me. Genesis 49, 29 give you these instructions. I'm about to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave of the field of Ephron the Hittite. Now if you know the Bible, Canaan was the land of promise, wasn't it? The promised land where God would take his people, the place he promised to live with them, when he conquered it from his enemies. And Jacob saying, leave me in that place where God conquers. And uh, Matthew picks all that up in imagery in Matthew chapter 2 and talks about the prophecy about Jesus. Out of Egypt I called my son. And Jacob's living that out now. He's saying, look, I want to live in the place where God tells us to live, where God rescues us, where God is in charge. Take a moment out there for a second. What do you teach other people about the confidence of your life? What's the story that you sing in your life that other people get? Is it that you're looking to the land of promise, which is to be with God, which is far better? That this world isn't all that there is? Or does your life say that this world is all that there is? You see, Christ himself was a down payment as our forerunner who went through death and to the glory, the heaven, where he waits, preparing a place for us, he says that there is better to come. The best is yet to come for every Christian. The question is, do you really believe that? Is your instruction to your kids and your grandkids, don't live for this life. There's way better. What about Christ? He's way better. His power will not diminish long after my strength has gone, so trust in him. Are you always trying to teach your kids and your grandkids and your friends to, to trust in you? That your confidence should be in yourself? You try and be something that you're not? Jacob says, that's stupid. See, God will carry on long after we've gone. Trying to impress other people in church by the ministry that you're doing so that you're indispensable? Rubbish, says Jacob. Teach them that they need to trust in God and they can do really well without you. Sometimes we hear people in a congregation like this say, well, it'll be really sad when old Fred dies. What will we do without old Fred? I mean, it's a lovely sentiment. They say things like this. He always takes out the bins. And uh, he always oils that squeaky gate with the WD-40. What would we do without Fred? You see, Fred's been a great... I don't think there is a Fred here, is there? Just check in. Fred's been a great servant. But, you know, greater than being a servant is the master that we serve, says the Bible. And so the church will last long after all of us have gone. I feel a little bit like... Um, what's the Yorkshire guy from the Conservative Party who says, some of you won't be here in 40 years' time. William Hay, sorry, bad impression. I feel like that. But we won't, will we? Many of us won't be here. And after the youngest, most um, cocky of us have gone, the church will carry on. Because God doesn't need us. He's like the, the father who takes us to work with him. We've got our pretend tools and our pretend boots. He doesn't need us there. He allows us to be in church because of his grace. He allows us to work in church because of his grace. And so when Jacob's weakest hour comes, he says it's all of grace. I want you to realize this is my story. Leave my body in the place of promise because that's where strength is. And the second thing I want to do is make sure that you guys stay in the grip of God's grace. I want to leave you in the good of God's strength because I can trust you 
I can trust him with you. He'll lead you to better places than I could ever take you to. <laughs> Not a great thing to say. Second thing that we need to see is that in Jacob's passion, there is a transparent trust as he worships God. Jacob leads his family in a final act of worship, doesn't he? Generations kneel before the eternal God, and they gather together and they pray. Genesis 49, 33, he presses and prays and worships and teaches the family. He, it says he drew up his feet up into the bed, breathed his last, and he was gathered to his people. That was the last thing he did, was leave his fam- leave his, lead his family in worship. What were they left with? Was it regret and dis- bitter disappointment? No. Was it one of those funerals that I've been to, maybe you have as well, where it's just escaping reality? Is that where his family were? You know, I like to think of him up there somewhere, just having a nice time. Was that what they were left with? Wishful thinking. No, says the Bible. What future generations were left with is a passion for God. A deep reverence and worship for the living God. That he was with us. And he is with us. And if we're wise, we'll trust ourselves to him and we'll be with him. You see, what they were left with wasn't saying, I want granddad's cash. But they were saying, I want granddad's God. They saw him die, and they saw that the whole of life summarized was about what we worship and what we trust. And they saw the certainty that their granddad died with, and they say, I want the extraordinary, trustworthy God, the one of, who's worthy of all our worship, the God who's satisfied. Now, listen, you have to remember at this point, he's, Jacob's been in Egypt 17 years, and his son is the prime minister. <laughs> So he's living a pretty good life. Not bad for a farm labourer or a hired hand, is it? He's a wealthy man, but that isn't his central passion. And so they're all there, a bit like at the reading of the will before he dies, and they say, who's he going to bless especially? Who's going to get the special blessing of God? As seen in Genesis 48. And Joseph comes along with his two sons behind him, and there's a mighty surprise because Jacob doesn't bless the obvious candidates. He doesn't even look to his firstborn or Joseph, the prime minister, with priority. In fact, we find that the prime minister is bowing to this old weak man. It's like he's turning it upside down, Jacob, in the way that he's thinking. He's like saying heaven's agenda is very different. It's countercultural to the way our world thinks. Jacob beckons the grandsons nearer. Maybe Joseph thinks it's because his eyesight's bad. Because it is bad. His eyes are failing him. And then he blesses them. He goes to bless them and he puts his hands the wrong way around. And his right hand goes on the wrong fella. Well, that's what Joseph thinks. Goes to the place where the right hand is on Ephraim rather than Manasseh, the older brother. Verse 17, Joseph grabs his hands and says, Dad, you've got it wrong. Look, I know your eyes are bad, but don't get this wrong, will you? Chapter 48, verse 17. Is is this dementia setting in? Is this just an old man being awkward, unsettling the apple cart one last time just because he can? Or is he seeing something in faith? Has God shown him something? Joseph said to him, No, my father, this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. It's history repeating itself, isn't it? Exactly what happened to him. But yes, this time in a good way, because Jacob's acting in faith, in transparent trust. He's showing them that he, he really does trust the purposes of God. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. I too will become a people, and he, will, he too will become great. Nevertheless, his younger brother will be greater than he, and his descendants will become a group of nations. He blessed them that day. Hebrew says... Simply that he blessed them in faith. He blessed God and he blessed others. Because the plans of God were working through him. And it seemed senseless to a worldly viewpoint. He didn't own the land that he offered them. He allotted them a place that actually was at that time taken over by God's enemies. 
that he was suggesting to them they leave a fantastic life in Egypt to a place they didn't really know, a place they hadn't really seen. Give up the physical and the tangible, says Jacob, and let's go just for a moment with a hypothetical that God has a place for you, which is way better. And the word of one man, that God keeps his promises, gives them something to live for. <laughs> and so they go. Everything I give you is guaranteed, Jacob says, not because I've got anything to show you for it. I haven't got a down payment, I haven't got a bit of cash, I haven't got a bit of paper, but I've got a testimony of God who is good. And that guarantees that you're going to get this land. It's as good as done already. Joshua 16.4 tells us they got into the land, just like he promised. And Jacob pointed to that certainty, 11.1. 1. What does 11.1 1 say in Hebrews? Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. See, what he worshipped was an invisible city. A God who'd provided something Sorry, what he worshipped was an invisible God who was going to provide an invisible city. But he had a tangible experience in God's goodness in the past. And he says, I want to point you to the city with foundations which are built by God. You know, God's a great architect, boys. He never messes up. He doesn't miss one little thing off the plan. The blueprint is absolutely perfect. And so you can trust him. And of course, what he's really pointing to is the city of God, the place where God's people live for all eternity. The Lord Jesus Christ, heaven itself. He's in the big plan and grip of God's grace. And this is your priority, he says. Leave everything behind, boys. It's not worth holding on to anything. Just get going. The trappings of this world are nothing compared to living for God. Now, is that the testimony that your kids will have of you? He left everything behind because he didn't care about it. He just cared about getting to grace. Being with God forever. Is that what they'll say? Or they'll say, well, I know what he loved most was his caravan. That's what he loved most. He loved to be at the caravan. That's where he felt so comfortable. He loved grandma, of course. Not as much as the caravan, but he loved grandma. She was the apple of his eye. She meant the world to him and he was a different man when she was around. He loved his cricket and his bowls, and his darts, and the OAP breakdancing club down the library. He loved that. Is that really what you love? They're going to say Grand loved her knitting. Ah, oh, she loved Morse and Foyle's War and ITV and Channel 5. She could watch all afternoon if she had a nice biscuit, a cup of tea, but wouldn't it be sad if that's what they said about you at your funeral? You know, I've been to one or two, one of the peculiar privileges of being a pastor is you get to go to lots of funerals. And you get to take a lot of them. Sometimes people you don't know very well see people who've lived interesting lives, people who have some connection with the church. I remember one particular funeral where my eyes were really opened with a tribute. It was a teenage girl and she said, obviously loved her gran and knew her gran well, and she started writing this poem. I didn't hear the end of it until she got up in church and read it out. And she reminded God that her grand's chief affection was for bourbon biscuits. And that's what she really loved. So at the funeral, she said, God, remember to give Gran three sugars in her tea and two bourbons with it. And apart from the complete irreverence of that, she told me that Gran's chief passion couldn't have been to be with Christ, which is far better. Her life had conformed to a pointless exercise, reduced to a nothingness, because she minimised heaven as an insipid place where you just sit on the sofa. She missed the glory. Don't miss the glory of Christ, Jacob says. Don't miss the glory of living for something that will last. Give up everything, all your affections. Worship Christ with everything you've got. Younger people need to see older folk, that he is your chief affection. Younger people, you've got lots of passion, but where's it being directed? The tangible, the here and now, or the invisible city, the city of faith. See, there's great discernment here, because he doesn't just live 
for what is yet to come. He's also living for the internal and the internal inheritance. He's saying, look, if you grasp onto the word of God, which is true, it will change your life, it will change your heart. You can humbly trust in the wisdom of God. And you must humbly trust in the wisdom of God. See where Jacob's trust is? It is humble. He leaves this world in a very understated way, doesn't he? Did you notice? His feet drew up into his bed and breathed his last and he gathered. He was gathered to his people. Simply, Hebrews 21 says he just leaned. That's all he could do. He relied on God. He rested in God. That's all he could do. But that's all he needed to do. He had no strength of his own. What did he trust in? On the strong arm of God, it says. It's not too short to save, says Isaiah. God can do anything. God never changes. His ear is not dull. He doesn't go deaf in old age. God doesn't sleep or slumber. And see, the thing is that death will come to every one of us. And weakness will come to every one of us. But the day will never come when God is weak. Because <laughs> God's strength will never be dis- diminished. And so he's never unready to save his people. And so physically this man looks wobbly and weak. But spiritually his footing is sure and he's stronger than he's ever been. Because he's going into eternity with God. Like Paul says to Timothy, I know whom I've believed. And I'm absolutely convinced without wavering or shaking or doubting that he's able to guard what I've committed and entrusted to him that day, until that day. I know I'm weak, says a person who trusts in God, but I know that he's strong. Let me just suggest to you three characteristics about this guy as we finish. Firstly, he was inwardly renewed. He kind of proves that 2 Corinthians 4 verse, therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. The wisdom of living under the word of God, you see, is that You get stronger and stronger till you meet God. (laughs) You gear up in strength to be with your heavenly father. You are fighting fit spiritually when your body is conking out. It's a humble song that he sings. It's about the strength of God. And he's very honest. It kind of reminds me of Psalm 78. Have you read Psalm 78? Where it's the testimony really of God's people which say, they, they talk about God's goodness. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things, things from old things we have heard and not known, things our ancestors have told us, we will not hide them from their descendants, the next generation. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he's done. Great start. But as we go down the psalm, we look at verse 9, it says, The men of Ephraim, though armed with bows, turned back on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant. They refused to live by his law. They forgot what he had done, the wonders he had shown them. And despite Jacob's faithful testimony, his ancestors failed to live up to being God's people. And so again, it records the grace of God and the failure of man. And let me just say to you, if you're humble, you will tell people about your failures. You'll tell your grandkids not to make the same mistakes that you made. That's humbling, isn't it? Every generation will fail God, you'll say, but God will never fail any generation. That's the story of my life. That's the story of my life. And yet, at the other side, you'll show that your Psalm 1, blessed is the one who does not walk in the step of the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yield its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. There's a prosperity in God's people, which is inward, invisible, but eternal. A strength which comes from God. Second brief thing I wanted to just leave you with is that it's not a private confession of God, this. It's a public thing. Maybe you think you could be a Christian by not telling anyone. You can have a legacy of faith by just living a private Christian life. You can't, says the Bible. It's got to be a public confession, a private devotion, yes. Get alone with God and make sure that he's the strength and the confidence of your life. But the public, devo- the public confession is that I confess through my mouth that Jesus is my Lord. 
And if you do that, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, says Romans 10. That's how it works. You must tell people. Because the same Holy Spirit that gives you inner power, inward life, is the same Holy Spirit that gives you power to speak, says the Bible. Can't have private devotion and private faith. You can have private devotion expressed in public confession. And you must do that. That's what Jacob does. The final thing is that he's ready to go. Did you notice that? Jacob is ready to go. The enduring image of Hebrews is that he goes with God as his guide. He's leaning on the staff. Where are we going? I'm looking forward to this, he's saying. Take me, God. If God called you tonight, would you be ready to go? Are you looking forward to it? You see, Hebrews 11 is a, really a picture gallery of faith of all sorts of people who've gone before us. They've all gone. It's like a photo gallery that you see in a family home. I remember the first time I went to Dave and Rachel Smith's house. One of the most beautiful things ever. I walked into their hallway and they have a, a mass of photographs of the generations of their family. It's really cool. They're a lovely family. And God's been really good to them. And they were able to chart God's goodness, not just now and before, but as they looked at the next generation, as they got married, as the kids come along, and say, we're trusting God for that. It's beautiful. And maybe you're saying, look, I haven't got any family to leave a legacy of faith to. I want to tell you that God's family is huge. It's massive. And even if you don't have any biological family, there are folks in this church who need to be encouraged by you and to see you walk closely with God. Maybe you say, I've got a sad childhood that I remember and a non-Christian family and I want to tell you that failure isn't final. I want to tell you that right at your last moments, a bit like the thief on the cross, everything is redeemable with God's goodness. God's family is huge, his goodness is huge. As he blessed and as he worshipped, as he leaned, this guy says, actually, you know, people will see your certainty if you're really living close to God. Somebody will see it. There's nothing uncertain about the, uncertain about the future because God is the God of ultimate reliability. So tell someone. Encourage the younger generation as they go into the future. Hebrews 13, 7 says we should imitate those who've gone before us. We should look at the picture gallery and anticipate the picture gallery of heaven. And yeah, you and me will be there. Very small photo probably. <laughs> when you look at the masses of God's people. And the whole thing will say Christ is better. We've left nothing behind that we regret. We've, we've seen greater glory here in one millisecond than we saw in all of our lives. Because the risen Lord Jesus is here. Our sin is gone. He reigns forever. And all his people with him. And they are as big as the stars. And as numerous as the stars in the sky. And I can't get my head around how big God's family is. I can't get my head around how trustworthy he is. It's all come to this place when we're with him forever. Don't go to your final moments with regret, will you? That you never told anyone about the gigantic love of God. To be with him is far better. When we live a life of faith with words which say, Christ is trustworthy, and future generations will follow us, and I don't want my kids to follow me or trust me. I really want them to follow Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this glorious portrait of your goodness to one man. And we confess, Lord, that we are very slow to see your goodness traced through our lives. We thank you that we're sitting here this evening in the goodness of your grace. We thank you for your grace at work, not only in Job, Jacob's life, but in our life too. We thank you that you've given us a great story to tell of us about how you've always been our certain guardian. 
how you've loved our souls and given everything for us, how you're preparing a place for us, and how we will certainly one day be there and not regret any step of faith that we made for you. Lord, help us to be a blessing to future generations, please, so that our lives testify not to who we are, but to the glory of Christ. Lord, help us be an encouragement to those who follow us. We know that there can't be any fruitful youth and children's work in any church without those who are willing to constantly encourage the next generation. So we pray that we would be those people who are overflowing with grace and say, trust him, because although we're untrustworthy, he is certain for eternity. Lord, help us do these things so that our life counts and the glory goes to Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.